Kristen Jaya and um, yeah, I'm going to be doing a short reading from Inside the Night, which is in the Unbound Anthology. So yeah, I shall begin. <laughs> um, it starts with a new picture of things. I'll just hold it up so you can see it because it's pretty cool formatting in the design. And yeah, the headline of the newspaper clipping is Local Schoolgirl Found Dead in Suicide. And the text that is shown on that clipping is Blackthorn, the body of 18 year old Marley Swan was found in Blackthorn Woods in the early hours of yesterday morning, but below the West Tower of Blackthorn Castle. Mr. Reynolds, head teacher at Blackthorn Community College, England's highest achieving school for those aged 11 to 18 years, said Malia was a very promising student who had her sights on Oxford University. Her loss will be sorely felt by all who knew her. Now we go on to chapter one. And yeah, this beginning of this chapter is actually like the first thing that I knew I was going to be writing for this story. It just came to me pretty much fully formed this first chapter. So I really like this chapter. <laughs> so chapter one, in the darkest corner of the darkest town, a small boy stands with his hands raised up to the sky. Ali watches him from her window, her cigarette smouldering in her fingers. She knows she shouldn't be able to see him, not when it's so dark, but the power has done strange things to her eyes. She only has to hone in on something, or someone, in the darkness, and her vision gets brighter, sharper, clearer. Ali almost wishes it wouldn't. It would be easier not to watch the transformations taking place, but she is transfixed, as always. Ali takes a puff of her cigarette. The smoke hits the back of her throat, gritty, raw. She's still not used to it, but Rico suggested it would help calm her anxiety. No one should ever do anything that Rico says, especially not Ali. He's no Donovan. She doesn't even know how she can look at Rico so calmly each day and not want to kill him. But she does look at him calmly and she takes his advice. Three days ago, she also took the cigarette packet he offered her. Ali mused over that gift for a long time and she still thinks about it now as she tries to work out whether, whether the cigarettes are a peace offering. Or maybe even a message that says, I believe you. Rico might feel guilty about what Kyle did to her, about how the whole town treated her. And if he does, maybe that means not all the O'Donovans are bad. Or maybe she's thinking too deeply about all of this. What Kyle did happened four months ago, after all. And with everything that's happening now, with the sonifications, she saw Rico's not giving it any thought. At any rate, she supposes he's right. Smoking does calm her anxiety because she's not shaking with fear and constantly thinking about Ellie as she watches the small boy in the street. Sweat isn't running down her spine in torrents, sticking her shirt to her back. She's just there, watching it all, a picture of calmness. Even though she's not really feeling it. What's happening can't sink into her now because the cigarettes have provided a barrier, a numbness. Or maybe it's the alcohol that did that. She's not really sure. When her mind is numb, she can't think about that night the night it all started. And when she doesn't think about that night, it's like it never actually happened. Like Kyle never held her down on the scratchy carpet that smelled of cat piss while he mocked her, called her baby. The haze of the nicotine and alcohol rewrites her past and Ali likes that. She should be in charge of her own story. The boy's trying to move his arms. She can see the concentration on his face. He's not a screamer and she's glad. Those are always the worst to watch. By now, he's probably too far gone. He'll no longer know his name, no longer know where he is. All he'll know is that he must lift his hands up to the sky, because that's what all of them do, the night worshippers. His fingers are offerings to whoever and whatever being is up there. The power that is getting stronger and stronger. The power that appeared 18 nights ago. Sometimes Ali thinks she must be immune, but she won't ever succumb to the power not the way the majority of the town's other, do other residents have. She will never become a statue. She's convinced of it at times because the power's given her night vision instead. And it wouldn't do that if it was just going to claim her anyway, would it? But no one knows. Ali, her best friend Ion, Rico, and the others in the team appear to be the only survivors in Blackthorn. There aren't many people left alive in England now. Most fled after the second night and most who stayed became worshippers. Of the survivors, or the stupid remainers, depending on who you ask, Ali is the only one with a power. Not that she's told anyone. 
So maybe others have the powers too? The best kept secrets, because everyone's looking for someone to blame. The witch hunt started after the third night. Raving gangs of men and women who kill anyone who they think could be behind the stonifications. There are still angry mobs out there, even if many of the hunters have been stonified by now. The witch hunts may not be happening near her town anymore. The last report she heard was that the hunters were going north, but she's not stupid. Tell someone she has a gift, she'd be the next poor sod hunted down, and she wouldn't put it past Rico not to kill her himself. He's no Donovan, even if he does seem a bit nicer than Kyle and the others. He, or whichever hunter came after her, would think she deserved it, but somehow this was all stemming from her, just because she's got a power and everyone calls the thing in the sky the power. People invariably see patterns and connections where there aren't any. That's what Rico is always saying, anyhow. He's the leader of Ali's team. Only a few days ago, no, only a few days in or so, after it became obvious that the power that had taken over the night wasn't going anywhere, the team started to spring up across the country. The police and the army and the scientists weren't doing a great deal. The government was running daily conferences and live press announcements of their proposed actions until the prime minister himself turned to stone on camera while the whole country watched. Ali laughed darkly when that happened. It was the PM's own fault for doing the live update at night. He should have known better. The stonifications only happen, only happening in England and Wales so far. Twitter is full of Americans laughing about it. Only last week, a group of New Zealand teenagers made a video where they pretended to have caught their stone disease too. They just wanted to go viral though. They wanted to be the first case of stonification outside of the UK. But it is clear by their laughter that they didn't really believe it. Ali doesn't understand why other countries aren't helping them. In Blackthorn, Rico was the one to gather up all the survivors. When he found Ali that day, he went white, very white, like he'd seen a ghost. What? Ali said defensively. She wasn't pleased to see him, and O'Donovan. Sure, he'd not been directly involved in the bullying and trying to discredit her work to the whole town, but he was still part of that family. I thought you were dead. He swiped at his head before shaking it hard. I'm sure you are. You, his face paled. No, that's not right. That can't be right, he said, his eyes on her. Is the power affecting anyone else's memory? Ali didn't know what he was talking about then, and everyone else looked at him like he'd lost his mind. A moment later, he dropped the subject and didn't bring it up again. But his eyes lingered on her for the rest of the night, heavy with suspicion and lit with a hint of fear. Sometimes she catches him looking at her that way still. It makes her furious. By rights, Ali should be suspicious of him. She finishes her cigarette now, trying not to think of what her parents would say if they saw her drinking and smoking as she watches the boy's final movements. As always, his hands are the last to turn to stone. The boy's fingers twitch twice, then no more. The night air is cold through her open window. It is still outside, silent, until she hears voices. Three men in their twenties, all drunk and loud, are staggering toward the boy. They see him, thanks to their flashlights on their phones, and they're laughing and shouting in a foreign language until their flashlights flicker out. Tourists, Ali thinks darkly. Blackthorn still gets a lot of them now. Before, holidaymakers would come in to see Blackthorn Castle, the oldest semi-ruined castle in Devon, infused with mythology and stories. But now, everywhere in Blackthorn is a destination because people want to see the town where the stonification started. Tour companies charge boatfuls of curious tourists extortionate amounts to cross the English Channel to see the land of the petrified. There are so many national and international visitors to Devon and elsewhere now, all wanting to visit the stone people. Tourists aren't affected so long as they leave by nightfall. At night, anyone in the area is fair game. A lot of the tour companies even supply their clients with booze. It's no wonder half of the tourists never leave, not when they're too inebriated or to remember that they need to leave before night falls. Or maybe some are just cocky and think that it won't affect them. That because they're not from England, they'll be safe, but they never are. Because it doesn't matter where you're from, it just matters where you are when night arrives. Ali can't imagine what sort of person would set up tours and sell people tickets to see this, knowing their clients will be in danger if they don't get back to the boat in time. And Ali's town isn't anywhere near the sea. Damn it. One of the men mutters, shaking his phone, but the phone is dead. All the phones are dead now. 
It's what happens at night. Cell phones die sooner if you're outside. The indoor ones will splutter out by midnight too. Come the next morning, they're all fine though, because that's when the power is sleeping. Silence falls, and they know what's coming. Everyone knows. Ali's kidneys hurt a little more than usual as she watches them. She didn't think she'd enjoy watching this, but she does, in a dark, weird kind of way. Something that she'd never admit. She knows men like this, the type who think they own everything, who think they're entitled to girls, who think they're the bee's knees. Ali wouldn't say she's a violent person. She's only wished death upon three people, and one of them she didn't even really mean it. But she finds she likes watching these men as they run from the darkest corner of the darkest town because she knows what's coming, and so do they. It's almost funny that they think they can escape it. Because no one can. No one outruns the curse once they've offered themselves to the night.